Joe Young. And as many of you know, I'm the President and CEO of Global Data Systems. I wanted to thank you all for joining us today for what we hope is a very informative 60 minutes. We've put together this webinar to hopefully answer many of the questions you have regarding why you need to upgrade to version 11, such as 5010 and the ICD-10 change that is looming and also show you how version 11 has changed so that you can determine how those changes might affect you and your practice during everyday use. We hope from this you can formulate if or how much training you and your staff may require for the upgrade to the new version. And to help you understand these changes, and with us today is Jennifer Monahan from our partner, Health One Technologies. Jen is a senior consultant and partner for Health One and she's going to provide us with an overview of the new changes in version 11. Jen will be discussing the practice management module changes, the chart module changes, and she'll discuss the workflow and system changes. In addition, we have Ed Powers, who is the Director of Technical Services for GDS, and Ed will be describing our upgrade process and how we plan on migrating you from version 9.5 to 11. And quickly, before I get started, I want to take care of a couple of housekeeping items. First, we would like to hold all questions until the end of the webinar. We have a lot of information we want to cover, and we want to make sure we get it presented for those who have tight schedules today. After the presentation, we will have a Q&A that you will be able to write in your questions via the control panel, and we'll respond to as many as we can. If we can't get to your question, we'll send out an email with answers to our, the unanswered questions to everybody who's uh, present today. Second, this webinar will be recorded and we will e email everyone a link so that you or anyone else in your practice can listen to the presentation at any time. And then last, over the coming weeks, we will be contacting each of you individually to, to discuss the upgrade, scheduling, training, the impact this may have, and answer any practice specific questions you have. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jen. Thank you, Joe. Um, perfect. There we go. Okay. So I have up in front of me a test version of Center City Practice 11. And I am going to begin by just reviewing the front screen a little bit and some of the changes that have happened there. And then I'm going to go into the practice management side a little bit and just review a few of the uh, new buttons that we have on the screen, new functionality, and then also to review a little bit of the ICD-10 information and how that has changed in the practice management system. From there, I'm going to go ahead into the chart module and review the clinical impact or clinical workflow impact that's going to happen um, to providers and their staff while documenting in CTS-11. And then lastly, I am going to review what the workflow changes and training impl implications might be for practices. Um, so what I'm seeing, what everybody should be seeing right now is the front page of Centricity CPS 11. And you're going to notice there are a few new buttons available on this screen. The first one is this account summary tab. The Account Summary tab is a new feature with the PM side that's going to allow you to look at information for a guarantor as a whole. So previously, if I wanted to see uh, inf financial information for a guarantor, I, would, I didn't have an easy way to do that. Now with the Account Summary tab, I can click on that, and I can see any patient that is associated with this particular guarantor. So I see his name, I see his baby's name, and I see his wife's name. And all of that information is rolled into this account summary. So I can see their, their balances, their aging, I can see all of the transactions. So this is a new feature with uh, CPS 11 that's very useful in tracking guarantor information and what's payable to a family. So in particular for pediatric groups and um, family practice organizations that have to worry about tracking information for the family as a whole, this will certainly be helpful. From here, there are a number of things I can just easily find a new patient, look up a different guarantor. All of that information is right here in front of you then. Another new button that we have on this main page is the financial 
financial dashboard, what this is going to allow us to do is actually, and this can be customized and tailored for groups as needed, but this is going to allow you to look at your practice as a whole and understand things like accounts receivable and revenue, um, revenue cycle. What I can do here is I can look at a graph and a dashboard for a number of different things and I can filter it. So for instance, these are the metrics. Now these are the only metrics that are available for us to report on in this, in this dashboard. So you can't tailor it and add custom reports or anything like that, but you do have these particular metrics which are pretty useful. We have things like gross charges by provider, the number of visits, percentage of billing by the balance, and then there's actually another one here which is just the percentage of billing status. And I can just take these metrics and drag them into whichever window I would want to see them in. I can also provide some filters. So if I don't want to look at all providers, I can actually just select a particular provider's information that I would want to see. And this is for accounts receivable, and then there is a tab for revenue and visits as well. So this is a high-level way for administrators and providers to come in and just take a look at their financial practice and see how things are going without getting into the actual reporting module and digging through reports and trying to figure out which way, which report to look at and find the information that you need. The last new tab on this page for the practice management side in particular is task management. And what this allows you to do is allow your billers in the office to actually create queues. So if you have billers that work on a particular provider or they want to look at patient balances that are over a certain amount or a certain insurance carrier, you can create queues that can be worked from this window. Uh, many of the billers in the, that may be on the call are probably used to the billing window and filtering your search criteria. This actually can streamline that process a little bit by creating these, the queues available for you. And if you have multiple billers in the organization, you can set it up so that each and every queue is listed separately. So if you see here, I actually have three queues set up for the different billers in my organization, and their information is listed down here. I can see what I'm filtering by. And then if I actually click on that queue, it would show me all of the billing information, all the tickets that are available in that queue that I might need to work. So this allows you to work your AR and filter tasks throughout your billing staff, or even if you just have one biller, be able to define that a little more efficiently so that you're not necessarily working from the billing window. One of the big upgrades with Centricity Practice 11 is ICD-10. So we all know ICD-10 has been coming for what seems like years now, and uh, it has been pushed off again, but it, it will be coming shortly. So it's, it's best for organizations to just start, a, start getting that um, process in place now. Um, on the billing module, what has happened is we have Basically, Centricity has set this up to map ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes together. So I have a test visit that I've actually set up in here. And we can go in to my ticket that I created. And if I'm doing charge entry, and I know many of you probably have it set to your charges are coming over automatically, and that's, that's fine. But if I'm doing charge entry, what this allows me to do when I'm going here to enter my ICD-9 code, and I'll just pick something like diabetes because that's an easy one for us to look at. What will happen is it's going to bring me up a list of my ICD-9 codes, but I'm also going to see a corresponding ICD-10 code. So if I were to want to pick just standard diabetes, you can see there is no associated ICD-10 code with that now. They've actually gotten much more specific so you have to dig into the details of it and find a corresponding code that would match that. And that can be true with any code that you might put in here. And it'll just give you a list, and then you'll see your matching code associated. And from there, currently what it will do is just send out the ICD-9 code on your claim, but eventually in the future as we switch over to ICD-10, it'll just do that mapping for you and the ICD-10 code will go out with your claim. 
There are many other smaller changes in the billing window, the module of practice management. Um, I'm not going to go into all of those today. So those are the high level changes that you will see with that side of it. There are, like I said, a lot of details that we're not covering here, but they are definitely in there. And um, as you get into implementing this upgrade, you will get a workflow process that happens in your office and hopefully some training to get the details behind it. I'm going to go into the chart module now because there are definitely a lot of changes. As soon as I open up the chart window, people are going to notice it looks completely different uh, than Centricity 9.5 did previously. One of the main things they've done is they've actually changed the way that we navigate. So this actually looks more like uh, an Internet Explorer page or um, you know, something a little more modern and friendly than the old tabs across the top sort of process that Centricity has had for years and years. What they've done is they've flipped this. So I now navigate down the side. So when I'm on my desktop, I used to have and a flags tab, a documents tab, multiple tabs across the top. They flipped all that, so now it's down the side. So if I want to look at a more detailed view of my flags, I just click alerts and flags, and it takes me to what looks very similar to the old centricity. So this page has mainly changed just in the way that it looks. The functionality behind it is pretty much the same. There are a few things that are different at the top of the window, you will notice I used to have a new flag button and a view flag, um, and there was a chart button at the top. Those are no longer there. So now I click new flag, and it brings me to the same flag window that I've always known, but the button that I click is different to get there. Down the left-hand side, I also now have um, my messaging. If anybody has um, a patient portal that they're set up to do messaging to their patients or to other providers, that tab is here, as well as scheduling and registration. And these just take me to my normal scheduling module of Centricity, just like they did before. So it's just the button itself that has actually moved. Same thing with registration. That'll take me to my main registration window, as it did previously. I also have, at the bottom, some new buttons. So I do have a chart button still, which will take me to the last chart that I was in. And I have a new button called Quality and Report. This is a functionality that you have to turn on with Centricity. Uh, what it does is it actually can show you some quality reporting options available, um, PQRS reporting, things like that. If you're using the MQuick system, it'll link directly into that so that you can actually see those reports from this tab. Find patient window, you'll notice is here. So they've actually saved us a click. I used to have to go to chart and then find the patient. Now I can just click Find Patient, and I do have my little drop-down window here, so I still keep my most commonly accessed charts or most, most recently accessed charts would actually be available in the drop-down. So that's the same functionality as before, just again a different name and a different, uh, different way of accessing it. I'm going to go ahead and go into my test station here. And you're going to notice a lot of changes on this window. The chart looks completely different than it did previously. First thing you're going to notice is my patient banner. I used to have that blue or green bar that went across the top with my patient information. That is now switched. So now I have all that information right here in this window. So I can see my, my patient's name, their age, their birth dates, all that information is the same. Again, it just looks and feels differently than it did before. The summary tab of my chart has changed quite significantly. So in Centricity 9.5, I had a summary that I was able to see problems, meds, allergies, directives. All that information was on the page. And then I had top tabs that went across the top of the page to access more detailed information. What they've done now is 
we can do a couple of things. We again have the navigation down the side, just like we did on our desktop. So it's, it's very similar in the look and feel throughout the application. However, a couple of things have changed here. One is I've lost my flow sheet view on this page, and I've heard a lot of complaints from providers and staff about not having the flow sheet on the chart summary. So I want to make sure that everybody is aware that they did take that off of this page. You can still get to it by clicking your flow sheet button, but it's not back on that main chart summary. From here, I can do a couple of things. So notice first that they've given me ICD-9 and ICD-10 on my problems. So Centricity has gone through this process and they've done matching as best as possible. So if things had an ICD-9 code, they tried to provide an ICD-10 code associated with it. Now again, this is something that as providers go through the process, in particular as you go through the ICD-10 adoption, you're going to need to look at those codes, clean up your problem list, make adjustments as needed, um, just to be sure that the algorithm behind the scenes did everything correctly for you. So there will definitely be some work when you're ready to implement ICD-10. Centricity has automated as much as possible a matching process for you so that you don't have to do all of the work. Beyond that, what they've done is I can easily access from here by clicking a button, I can see all the details of a particular problem. So when I click on the plus sign, I'll see if they had assessments, I'll see um, any documents associated with it, I can see my end date, all of that information. The other thing that I can do is I can blow this up so that I'm just looking at my problems, for instance. So that'll blow this window up to a full page so that I can have that feel of the tab that I had before. So now I'm looking at a bigger view of my problem list. And then I can do the same thing with medications and allergies, directives, all of those buttons that are there. I can click the little square at the top right corner of all of them, and it will actually um, expand and shrink those buttons as needed. I do apologize, there's a little bit of lag in my screen this morning, so hopefully uh, it doesn't delay us too much. That is not the system. I'm actually working uh, in a spot that doesn't have good internet today. Um, with each thing, problems, meds, allergies, directives, we also have the ability to, and this is a huge addition with centricity, we now can add, remove, delete, change any of these lists from this window without creating a new note. So previously in Centricity, if you wanted to adjust a problem or a med, you had to go start an update. Many of you would probably choose a clinical list update, make the changes that needed to happen, and then um, end that update and sign it. So it was a lot of work just to add a problem or a med. Now what we can do is right from this window, if I want to add a new problem, I can click this plus sign right here, and it'll take me to a spot where I can enter a new diagnosis. Now, one of the other things that they've done is they've given us this new quick search feature. So in Centricity CPS 11, they've created the problem search to be more like a uh, Google search, for instance. So I can start typing certain things, and it'll go look for that information for me. And it gets smarter as you use it. So if you search for a particular problem, you don't find it, you look for it in a different way, that'll continue adding to your list. So the concept of custom lists can sort of go away because each user has their own custom list built for them as they continue to use the system. Along with that, though, we do still have the ability. So as I click down here, I still can choose a custom list that I might want to use. It's a, as an option, it's there, but I don't necessarily have to do that. So for instance, if I'm looking for an insect bite, it's going to go ahead and start looking for that for me. So I can just click on it. All I did was start typing it, and it brought up the most common search for me. So anybody that's using Centricity now on the clinical perspective, you know that if you were to start typing insect bite, you would get a list of anything that matched that, and you may have to scroll up and down to actually find it. You don't have to do that anymore. It will actually look for it, put it in there for you, the most common one, and right there it is. 
from here I can see my description, I can add any comments, I see the ICD-9 and the ICD-10 code. And then this functionality with the onset date and the duration is the same as it was previously. None of that has changed. When I click OK, that's actually going to go ahead and add that to my problem list. So I did all of that right from this window without going into a note, without doing an update, ending it, signing it. It just created it for me right here on this screen. Same thing is true with medications. Um, I can just click a button to add it. Now they've only given us this quick search feature in the problem list. We don't have it in meds or allergies or anywhere else. We still have the custom list concept there. But we do um, have the ability to add right from this window just by clicking the button. Once you click the button, it takes you to your standard centricity window for adding a medication. Nothing has really changed on this screen. If you want to remove something because a patient no longer is taking it, um, it's a problem that's been resolved, there is just an X right here, and I can just click and say stop taking this medication. I can choose why they quit taking it, maybe they had a reaction, click OK, and that's going to remove that from that patient's list. So all of that can happen right from this window. It is an area that I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, later in my presentation about what the workflow should be in your practice, who, who has the ability to do this, and when they might want to do it. So we'll talk about that in a little more detail in a few minutes. The other thing on this window um, that is new is the alerts and flags tab down here. So many of you that are on Centricity 9.5 are probably already using Care Alerts. Um, so care alerts are an option available down here, and I can create a new flag or a new care alert just from this window just by clicking here, and then I could set up my care alert right from this page. I can also still do that from doing the new flag button at the top, so I can do it in either place. It's still an option for me. You'll also notice at the top of this screen, I have these little buttons on the far right that are telling me how many flags and documents I have. So this is useful if you're in the middle of a chart update, um, you know that you have some labs coming in or phone calls coming in that you need to address. You can just click the unread flags and it's going to take you right to your flags tab. Same thing with documents, and it'll take you right to that window. So it's a quick way of going back and forth. And then um, you can just click back to your chart to get back to the chart module. So just as I clicked um, the buttons on the top right corner, my navigation at the bottom works the same or on the left, I guess. So I can click Problems, and it'll expand that view for me. If I want to go to my Documents, I just click Documents. It's going to take me to my normal Documents tab, just like I had before. So this screen itself looks very similar. There are a few changes in the way that it looks and feels. So for instance, there's no Update button. I think that is my favorite change. The Update button has gone away. Um, what they've done in its place is they've actually created a button called New Document. So when we're ready to actually do a note now, we don't click update, we do new document. And I'm going to get into that in just a few minutes. I did want to point out that change um, because it's quite significant and some people struggle with that in the beginning. So the tabs, as we go down through, you're going to notice they look a little different, uh, but the functionality is the same for the most part. So my flow sheets look and feel the same. I have my flow sheet views just like I did previously. You can see all my information across here, my graphs, everything's here. Notice I do have an edit button on my flow sheet. So for anybody that uh, may be pediatrics, for instance, and you're having issues with immunizations getting updated properly or things are in the wrong spot, uh, many times one of the complaints we hear from nurses is I need to update my immunizations, but I need to start a whole note, and it becomes a little bit of a hassle. I can do that now from the flow sheet button just by clicking edit, and I could find my value here, or I could add new if I needed to. 
So if I, for instance, want to change something on this flow sheet, I can just scroll down through and we'll just say that my height was entered as 70, but it really should have been 68. So I can just click on it and hit change and change that value right here. And that's all done just from the flow sheet tab. I did not create a note. I didn't do anything. It was just from here. Orders, again, look and feel the same. The only difference is I have an add button. So many, if I, if I have any providers on the call, I'm sure this is one, you know, you sign a lab and you need to order a reflex lab of some kind, and you have to append it and start a note and order the lab. Now we can actually just go to the Orders tab, click Add. It will give us our normal orders window of centricity that we're used to seeing, and I can add my order right from here. So for that insect bite that I just added, I can say that I need to do a lab. I can sign that and it'll actually put it on the orders module for me if I were a doctor. There we go. Okay. And that added that right to that order screen, and it'll process it from there as you do normally per your workflow. So if you print them, or some of you may send them electronically to lab systems, um, that'll process that just like it would as you do right now. Histories view, so this is very similar to what you have now. I'm assuming everybody is using the histories view in Centricity 9.5. Nothing has changed a whole lot here. Um, pretty much the same look and feel as it is currently. The quality tab, as I mentioned earlier, if you have MQuick enabled, you would actually be able to see for this patient their quality reports and their quality dashboard. This does require you to have MQuick in place. Um, so if you are not using that, the quality tab will look kind of like mine does right now. It'll be more of just an advertisement of why you should use MQuick. Protocols button is the same window. We'll just pop up what your patients do for. If you're using protocols now, it should be exactly the same. Graph button will pop up my ability to graph. Again, for peeves, I have my growth chart just like I do now. All of that information is the same. It just gets accessed in a different way. Handouts, again, same concept. Everything's the same as it used to be. It just got moved. Okay, let's go ahead now and get into a chart update. So I'm going to create a new document. That's how I access it now. Once I click New Document, it's just like my update window. So from here, I'm going to see all of my visit types that I used to have previously, my, my provider. Everything will be here as it was. So I'm going to choose a primary care visit. Click OK. And it's going to load up my forms to start documenting at that point. This is um, our test system, so these forms may not look like your forms. These are ones that we have customized in our system. Um, so if, if yours look and feel differently, the concept will be the same. Your forms will just appear a little different on the screen. So first thing you're going to notice is it looks a lot different. I no longer have um, the close button at the bottom of my form. So I used to hit close and go to end update. That's not there anymore. What I have now instead is I have the ability to navigate on the left side. So I can quickly go to a patient summary, which is a different form in my visit. These are all the forms that are there. I used to have to go next form, next form, or some of you may have had buttons at the bottom of your screen that provided navigation. I can now do that just by clicking right over here. So I just click on a form and it brings that form up for me. 
The other thing that you can do if we have any tablet users in the forum, they've actually also given us these little buttons on the left and right that allow us to still flip through our visit if we need to. So that is kind of like your next form and previous form, um, but it's just in a different way. So if you have people using tablets, you can sort of almost see that iPad feel where you can flip through, and this will allow you to do that. One of the things that um, Centricity did that uh, can be a pro or a con, I guess, is they actually got rid of the ability to modify a medication or a problem from this window. So what happens now is I have a button up here that says medication, but it's only going to give me the ability to add a medication, not to actually modify or change it. If I wanted to modify or change a button, I need to go back to my summary. Once I'm back on the summary page, I then use, oh, sorry guys, i got windows open everywhere here. Once I do that, it will actually allow me to um, modify the button using the summary, the, the add problems, add meds button just from the main summary page. So what many people have done is they've gone through their forms and just made sure I have on forms buttons to do problems and meds and allergies. So for instance, this, this is a set of custom forms that we have, and I have a medication button that will allow me to go to where I can modify a medication. So that is an area as you're going through the upgrade process that you need to think about from a workflow perspective. Because if you need to leave your visit to go modify a medication, that can be a little bit of uh, inefficiency. So you may want to make sure you look at your forms and that you have a spot to modify them. Because as the functionality is within Centricity, it will only give you the ability to add a new one, not to modify it. The other thing that they've done is we used to close our form to see what our note looks like. So that has gone. Now what I have is I have forms and I have text. And when I click on text, that takes me to my text translation. So I can see the form itself. If anybody's using dictation placeholders, drag in, anything like that, that you want to drag in back in the white space of your note, you have to click the text button to come back and do it from there. So you can't do your forms with your dictation placeholders like you may have in the past. You need to click over to text, and then you'll be able to get it from there. The other main change is because I had no update button, I have no end update button. So what they've done in the top right corner, I now see a button that says end. So I'm going to click on end, and then it's going to take me right to this normal window. So now I would follow my workflow like I did previously, and I would either sign this or hold it, route it to whoever it needed to go to. That's what would happen from here. I'm going to go ahead and hold this one so that we can take a look. I want to show you in this top left corner, these are all the documents that are open for this patient. So previously, I would have had to have gone to the Documents tab and maybe sort it by the status to see what was on hold or unsigned for this patient. Now, everything that is pending will be on the top left corner. So for instance, I have this chart maintenance document open. And uh, I have my little asterisk telling me that this is a clinical list lock. So I'm sure that as I was doing that demo, you guys noticed that there was a, a message coming up that I couldn't add a medication, for instance. This chart maintenance window has the clinical list lock on it, so it needs to be signed or reviewed or taken care of um, before I can add something else to this chart. That concept is exactly the same as it is today in Centricity. It's a little easier to identify now because I can see it right in this window. And what I would do is I would just click Edit from here. And then if I needed to sign it, I would just end my update and sign it. And that will take care of that document now, and it leaves my pending list. 
few other small changes they've done to, to this chart module. Um, I Now my phone note and my Renew RX button are in a different spot. So remember previously with the tab, the phone note, and the, the Renew RX button were right smack in the middle of the page. Now they're at the top. They're the same once you click on them. When I click Renew RX, it's going to take me to my prescription refill page just as it is today. So the workflow you would follow would be the same. It's just where you click the button is different. I can end this. I'm going to discard it. You would take care of it as per your normal workflow. Same thing with the phone note button, just in a different spot. But when you click it, it'll bring up your phone note as it is today in your system. You would follow your workflow and just take care of that. OK, so those are the major changes in CPS 11. Most of it is cosmetic um, as to the look and feel of the system and learning how to re-navigate. One of the things I always say is as end users, we tend to map our brains to where we click things. And sometimes you don't even think about what you click because it's just mapped to do that. When you go to CPS 11, we're going to have to remap basically our um, brains to click in the right spot. So one of the things that we recommend is that everybody go through some training. We have found it to be about two hours of training, depending on the role. But for most clinical staff, it's about two hours, just to make sure that everybody understands the concepts behind adding a problem, for instance, from this window and what the workflow impact might be for that. Um, before we get into the actual training session, I usually recommend that we do some sort of workflow assessment just so that everybody understands um, what they're going to do on the go live day so that we know nurses are maybe going to enter all their information from the summary page. Or maybe they're going to start their note as they did previously and update everything within the note. So that workflow process will really make sure that everybody in the office is doing what they need to do on that go live day. The system, as I said, is conceptually behind the scenes. Everything is the same. It has the same database structure. I can add a problem here, or I can add it from a note, and it goes to the same place. But it's just a matter of how you want to how you want the process to be in the actual office flow. Um, the other thing is there are a few security changes that need to happen. So, for instance, this ability to add problems in meds; those are things that are a security setting, and users either have the ability to sign that or co-sign it or not sign it at all. So those are things that we need to address and deal with before we actually go live with the system. Um, a few other minor things. This is a good opportunity. Many of you have probably been on the system for several years. So it's a very good opportunity to go through your administration module, look at problems, look at your custom list, look at your orders, uh, make sure that your system's clean. So it's just a good time to clean up, do some housekeeping, make sure that um, it's as clean as possible before you do that upgrade so that as things get added or changed, it doesn't impact it. And then secondly, uh, when you actually go live, it's probably a good idea to have somebody on site for that actual go live. And that could be a super user in your practice, or it could be somebody outside that you bring in to actually help people get through the changes that are in the system. Um, with ICD-10 coming down the pike and just the overall efficiency that you can gain with the CPS-11, it is something I would encourage people to move to sooner rather than later. CPS-11 is not Meaningful Use Stage 2 certified. Uh, that product will be coming out, I believe, later this year. But it will still continue to get you moving forward so that you're not necessarily doing meaningful use stage two, an upgrade, everything else that might have to happen in your practice. So I would encourage folks to
to consider doing CPS 11 sooner than trying to capture ICD-10 and all the other components that might have to go along with it. So that is all that I have for the demo. I'm actually going to hand this over to Ed, who is going to walk you guys through what the upgrade process looks like on the global data system side. So Ed, take it away. Thanks, Jen. Uh, that was a great walkthrough of uh, CPS 11. Um, there's two things that I wanted to talk about. Um, keep it short and sweet so we can get to uh, some questions. Um, the first thing is uh, we have a demo system that we want to make available to everybody. We have created a unique username for each practice so that you each can log in to the same demo and test everything out. It's a, uh, it's a great way to sort of follow up with what Jen showed you, all these changes, and actually click things for yourselves and get a, get a feel for things. It's the uh, standard GE demo database with people you may have already known if you've used a demo before, Dr. Harry Winston and patients like Don Bassett. <clears throat> it is just standard GE forms in there, so any of your forms uh, will not be in the demo database. Uh, those will come when we actually do your upgrade, your test upgrade. But you will access the, the demo database the same way you access your live system. You'll go to our, um, our logon site and uh, you can uh, log in with that demo user and you will only see the, the, the demo um, site to access. You won't see any of your other shortcuts at that point. You can share the logon with people in your practice, but only one person can actually be using the, the demo at a time. If you find that you would need to make the demo available to more than one person, just let me know and I can get additional demo accounts created. There, there is a little work to do to set up those demo accounts to link everything properly so you have access to what you need. Um, logon screen that you're going to see is a little bit different. Um, but it's the same logon process, the same account that you log into. Our Citrix web access screen will be used here just like you do in our live system. Um, as far as the upgrade process itself goes, uh, we're going to talk to each and every one of you um, separately and schedule the actual upgrade. Um, we have quite a few of these upgrades to perform, so we're going to try to put a schedule in place we're not going to try. We have to put a schedule in place, lock people in, and so that we can continue to move things forward. But the process that we're going to go through is to prepare the new environment, which does take some work on our side because we're going to be moving you to new servers, and you know it'll be a transparent move to you guys. Um, and then once we have that test environment ready, or that new environment ready to go, we're going to perform a test upgrade of your live database. And it'll be that, that point in time of your data. Um, it'll include everything that you have in CPS 9.5, all your forms, all of your customization to letters and templates will be there. And it'll be exactly what you would see on the, um, the day of uh, go live upgrade. Um, We'll present that to everybody or a limited subset of users. Again, we'll discuss that with you, but we can uh, make this available to everybody so that they can actually get in and, um, and see things for themselves. Um, to go along with what Jen said, we really recommend some training. As you can see from what she just showed everybody, there's a lot to CPS 11. Um, and we really highly recommend that you go through some type of training. Um, again, we'll meet with each one of you guys and give you all the options that we have for that. Um, the other thing along with training that we really recommend is to follow a very thorough testing plan. Because of all of the new things in CPS 11, we feel it's a good idea to make sure that you test everything and have a good plan to test everything so that on go live day you're not finding things that aren't working that we could have potentially uh, you know, remedied beforehand, um, specifically with things like your forms, your letters, and any content. Um, 
you know, let's test all the printing functionality to make sure that printing works. Let's test faxing, and you know, there there are probably a few other things that need to be tested. Um, just to say it out loud, things that can't be tested in your test databases, we can't test e-prescribing because the way the SureScripts network works is you can only have one authorized uh, e-prescribing database and we don't want to break your live environment while you're testing. And you can't test EDI. You're not going to want to uh, send charges through to GE Clearinghouse or whatever clearinghouse you're using or you don't want to pull, out, pull down remittances. They only know you as one practice. So we disable those things in the test environment um, so you don't inadvertently do things that might uh, cause problems in your live system. And the other thing we can't test is interfacing. We, we can't test the live aspect of interfacing. We can run uh, some sample messages through from many of your reference labs and have you see those things. Um, and from there we'll, you know, we'll just convert your interfaces on Go Live Day. Um, as far as the next steps go with us, uh, you know, we really need to, to talk to you guys and pick a point on the schedule and get it locked in on our side. Um, we're going to offer a couple different upgrade options. We're going to offer, you know, during business hours upgrade and after hours upgrade. Um, one of the things that we do recommend, and we're going to have some options for this, is that you have someone on site for Go Live Day. Uh, you know, Jan indicated that you might have your own super users that might have gone through training. Um, we're going to have other options for you as well. And then on Go Live Day, we always like to make sure that your appropriate staff is ready to go to handle any user questions, problems, or concerns and communicate with us directly so that we're uh, ready to answer um, your needs at the time of Go Live. And that's really all I have for the, uh, the upgrade process. Um, now I think we're going to turn it over since we still have a few minutes left here to get some questions and um, Joe will be uh, fielding those and throwing them out to Jen and I as you guys send them over. Thanks for your time. Uh, thank, thank you Ed and Jen. That was uh, very informative. I appreciate both you guys taking the time. Um, right now we do not have any questions. I'll uh, leave it open for a little bit and see if uh, any questions pop up. Uh, you just need to go to your uh, GoToWebinar control panel. There's a little question box where you can type a name in and send it. And um, we'll have uh, Jen or Ed answer any questions you have. It doesn't look like we have any questions at this time. Oh, there is. Here we go. <laughs> uh, one question I have here is when will CPS 12 be available? Jen, do you have any? Have you heard anything on that? Uh, yes, CPS 12 is scheduled to be released in the third quarter of this year. Um, I say scheduled because I'm always hesitant to say that. We I haven't seen any demo versions. I've seen um, some very very high level demonstrations at a Centricity conference, but I'm I'm somewhat skeptical that it's actually going to be released in the third quarter. That is the plan. Um, and, uh, you know, there are certainly people questioning whether they go to 11 or 12. My recommendation is normally to, to move to 11 and get that moving forward before we do 12, because even if it comes out in the third quarter, you're probably not going to want to implement it until next year. Okay, thank you. And Jen, while I have you on the hot seat, another question came in, which is uh, for you. And uh, it's from a, uh, a physician, and it, uh, the question is, how do I access clinical visit summaries, which needs to be printed with each note for meaningful use? Um, depending on if you're currently doing clinical visit summaries or not, um, they will be either in, so if you're currently doing them, you probably already have them in your handout section or your letters section of Centricity. Uh, so they can be printed from there. 
The other thing that uh, some of the forms that I had demoed in our system, we actually have forms that allow you to push a button on your assessment and plan, for instance, that will print your clinical visit summary. I'm assuming based on the question that you are maybe already in meaningful use and are just questioning if changes with CPS 11. If you're not doing meaningful use, I would say perhaps follow up with me later via email and I can um, give you some better direction on that. Thank you, Jen. Um, another question came in. For messaging in CPS 11, is the required login like CPS 9.5? I had to think about that one for a minute. I believe it is. I would have to verify that. If you can get an email address or something for that one, Joe, I'll have to just double check. I believe it is the same. I think it's just the... Um, the way that you access the, the navigation has changed. I think the, the behind the scenes is exactly the same as it was in 9.5. Okay. And uh, last question here I have so far, it's uh, probably more for Ed. Uh, the question is, is there an estimated timeline for this process? Um, well, from the time that we lock you in on the schedule um, to getting you your upgrade, your test upgrade, is probably about two weeks. So we would have your test upgrade presented to you two weeks before go live, or the, the targeted go live. Um, our CPS 11 environment is ready, and we have the foundation ready to go. So if someone wanted to convert to CPS 11, you know, three weeks from now, we could present you with, you know, do your test upgrade next week and, you know, get the party started. And I would just add to that that you probably want to add in extra time for that workflow assessment that I talked about, the training, things like that. Um, we're seeing most of our practices from a clinical application perspective taking about two, three weeks, depending on the size of the practice, just for that workflow and training component. So there's a technical piece that I'm talking about, and then you need to put that application piece in the middle as well. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Um, and another question here, uh, are there any significant changes in version 12 ver versus version 11 besides meaningful use stage 2 compliance? I, I can only say that I have seen some, like I said, very high-level demos. So there is not currently a release of version 12 that allows us to answer that in the best educated uh, way. Um, I think that there will be changes. I know they are changing fundamentally some of the concepts behind the scenes. I think that there are quite a few meaningful use stage 2 things that are going to make um, Centricity 12 be uh, a little different than 11. I think the biggest jump, though, is going from 9.5 to 11. I think going to 11 to 12 will be less of an impact than going from 9.5 to 11. That's what we heard as well, too. Um, we have not seen 12 yet. I don't know if anybody really has yet. Um, Jenna, have you, have you had any? Um, yes. Just demos at centricity conferences that I really yeah. don't hold water at this point because they're they're still vetting out some of this stuff. Right. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, I'll keep this open for another few seconds here before we um, close the presentation. Again, again, I wanted to remind everybody that we will provide a link to everybody who is on the uh, you know logged into the webinar today. So you'll be able to go back and replay this or replay this for anybody in your practice if and when the time comes. Uh, we'll get that out to you in the next couple of days. <clears throat> and um, I don't see any more questions. So at that, I will say thank you again to Jen Monahan and Ed Powers. And thank you, everybody here, for uh, joining us. And um, we will be in touch with everybody very soon. Thank you very much.